Greetings, church, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God is good. Yes, Joe got it right. God is good. <laughs> and all the time. Hallelujah. I am so happy to be here uh, to share the word of God. Uh, and thank you all for coming. And thank you all for being here. I was saying to people in the morning, they were looking serious. But Marcus assured me that you guys, you don't look serious. You can smile. So you are saying also, maybe some of the, you, they were actually smiling. Some of, sometimes the mask can hide the smiles, right? So can you wait for me this morning if you're happy to be here? That's powerful. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for all the people who have shared those powerful, encouraging messages. I wish I can always capture those moments because they're speaking prophetically to the church and they're very important. Uh, as you all know, my name is Passionate, and I want to thank my wife and my two kids here. They were with me in the first service, and they are here being on fire for God, which is what I'm going to preach about. And I was, I was trying to say something to Mark. I don't know whether it made sense. I'm like, okay, I'm beginning to feel what Mark and Joe have to go through, speaking in the first service, and then speaking again in the second service. And I was like, hmm, interesting. I don't know whether I'll be able to say it exactly, as I said it in the first service, these guys seem to do it well. They transcribe it. For me, we'll see how the Spirit of God leads us. Amen, church. Amen. Right. So the title of my, service, my sermon this morning is On Fire for God, uh, or Be on Fire for God, or Keep the Fire Burning. It was quite interesting. when I, Initially, I wanted to say Keep the Fire Burning. Somebody said, yeah, careful with that one. In North America, it talks about couples, about keeping the fire burning. <laughs> I'm sure you guys understand that for those people that are married. So we're going to get our scripture reading uh, from the book of Leviticus uh, and the book of Romans, and I'll read. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. And then if you go to Romans 12, verse 11, I have different versions from the one that is shown there. Never lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor. Be aglow and burning with the Spirit serving the Lord. Do not slack in your faithfulness and hard work. Let your spirit be on fire, bubbling up and boiling over as you serve the Lord. I'll pray. Father, we thank you that you are with us as we speak your word this morning. We pray that the Holy Spirit ministers to each and every one of us individually in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that you speak great mysteries in whatever state of our lives and our walk and our relationship with you where we are so that we become on fire for you continuously and relentlessly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So my objective today is to encourage the church of God to revive the love, the passion, the drive, the energy for God. You know, if you read the Bible in the book of Revelations, I think chapter 3, verse 16, a letter was written to the church of La La Lacodesia or Laodicea that had lost its first love. We say God, and God says, but I have this against you. You are neither hot nor cold, but you are lukewarm. And if you are like that, then I'll spit you out. I just summarized it. I didn't quote it verbatim. But I believe us as Christ Central Church, we are not a lukewarm church. We are not a cold church. We are not a miserable church. But we are a church of God that is on fire for God. Can you just tell your neighbor, no, they were allowed to talk. Can you just tell your neighbor, say, tell them, be on fire for God. Oh, come on, church. Some of you are not talking. Just tell your neighbor, be on fire for God. Hallelujah, church. Right. So I know I deliberately chose the book of Leviticus uh, because for those who have read the Bible, it's an interesting book. It's God is amazing. It shows how God was giving specifications of how he wanted people to sacrifice and you know, the steps and the priest and everything. So maybe somebody might be already say, ah, the book of Leviticus. But when I did some research, this is some of the things that I found out that are still relevant even to us 
today. So in the book of Leviticus, God was wanting or was desiring to fellowship with his people, which is still the same today, which is still important, which will still be important even in the near future when we are no longer here. God desires consistency on our zeal for the Lord and his kingdom. God's desire for us to be fully devoted to him. God also requires our time and our energy and our resources as we serve him. So those are some of the th thematic areas or things that were coming up from the book of Leviticus in why God wanted them to sacrifice and also why God said the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. Now, speaking to us, if you're even looking at the book of Romans there, it says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual favor serving the Lord. This goes on to show that God desires us as Christ's central church to have that fire in us, to have that drive to keep seeking him, to keep wanting to know him. You know, Paul says, that I may know him and the power that made him resurrect from the dead. And David says, bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. This is what God desires for the church. God doesn't want you to be lukewarm. God doesn't want you to be cold. God doesn't want us to, as a church to be confused, as if we do not know the God that we serve. But he needs us to be fired up. I'm sure if I'm just to talk about Joe, if I know the name that will make Joe go like, please, if you mention Angela, Joe will be like, <laughs> oh, you, you can tell. Even many of us who are married, you, you can tell. Even Mark and Debbie there, I can see Debbie behind the glasses. It's all written, Mark, Mark, Mark. That's the same thing God wants for the church. That's why God likens the church to the bride, right? He says the, ch the church is the bride and must be spotless. So God desires us to be on fire for him. He desires us to love him earnestly with so much zeal. You might be asking yourself, what can we do? How can I be on fire for God? Well, I have a few options for us today that I would like to share with us on the ways we can be on fire for God. So the first one, we need to give our lives to Christ. It's possible. I have been there. I've been to a church where we sit and you think everyone is saved. And you only come to shock. Oh, only a tenth of people in the church have actually given their lives to God. But I'm here to encourage us as a church today. If you haven't given your life to Christ, this is the time. I remember before I was saved. I used to be stubborn. I used to debate. I had a friend of mine who was calling me to come and join the church, who was trying to reach out for, to me to get served. And I asked him questions like, do you know God? Have you ever met God? Can you show him to me? Have Jesus, has Jesus ever touched your head? You are talking about the Holy Spirit. Do you know how the Holy Spirit looks like? And as we kept on debating, some of our classmates and schoolmates were around observing, and I was very eloquent and very full of myself and just going on him like that. My friend was a man of few words. I remember my friends, that the people around who were like around me, cheering me up, yay! You know, but then my friend says to me, you know what? I'm going to pray for you you might think you have won debating with me, fair and fine. But I'm going to pray for you. And what I know, before the end of this year, you will give your life to Christ. I was like, uh-oh. Well, <laughs> that's a, a statement of concession, you know. There's a victory statement, and that's for you who has lost. But what I didn't know, that I had not only started a war with him, but I had started the war with the great I am, the king of kings, the creator of the heavens and earth. Then one day we get invited to this revival that was happening. 
You know, in, in, in Zimbabwe, in Africa, maybe Dibaba can relate and other people from Africa there, we usually held revivals Monday to Friday, five hours every day, going, praising God, worshiping God. So I go to this revival one day to... to and then the minister there, and a guest speaker was invited. He was preaching, calling people to, to repentance. He says, you need to give your life to Christ. If you are to die today, where will you go? Are you going to go to heaven or are you going to go to hell? You need to give your life. I'm just summarizing the message. And then I'm seated there and I'm looking at him. My heart so full of pride. I didn't know much of things in life, but I, was, I thought I, know, I knew it all. I thought I, was, I know, I know, I know that God doesn't exist. I know that God is not there and these people are just bluffing. And... I saw many people standing up in tears, giving their lives to God, and I remained seated there. And then when he finished, he said, I know there are some people here who have not given their lives to Christ as a result of pride, that ignorant pride. So as I was seated on the, on the benches in the church, my feet started becoming heavy, and I, started, I wanted to stand and go home, but I felt so heavy. I was like, okay, what's happening here? And then all of a sudden, in my heart, I felt that push to go and see him. He had said, I'm going to wait for you in the office, the church offices, and I'm going to wait for you. You should come and give your life to Christ. I decided to go. I went, dragging my feet. When I got there, he was so excited. You should have seen how excited he was. He was like, you are the man that I was waiting for. And that pastor, even up to today, he's still my friend. He never forgets that day. You know, he's like, look at you. Look at you. Look at that day. Remember that day? Look at you. You know? And then I, I spoke to him. He told me about God. What, I made him preach another sermon after he did another sermon, one-hour sermon. I made him preach another one-hour sermon specifically to me. And I, I gave my life to Christ. I went to, my, to the resident pastor. I told him, I, I, I talked to the pastor, I want to know this God. And then they encouraged me in the Lord. And guess what? The next day, I went to school. I used to do athletics. I used to be a sprinter, 100 meters, 200 meters. But the next day, I go to school. And I was like a third option for high jump. And they said, oh, the first one is no longer here. Can you please come and do that? And then I jumped. I was, I, I'm going to try and explain this to you so that you understand. You know, when you do a high jump, there's a bar, one bar, one bar, then there's a cross bar, and then there's a mattress on the side. And we just put it, and then the next thing is the ground. So I missed the mat, went crashing on the ground. This part of my lower jaw, is that what you call it? It separated from my teeth. And I was admitted in the hospital for one week. I could not eat I was surviving on what you call it, the drips, yeah. because whenever I tried to put food, it would go here and cause some excruciating pain. It was so painful. But it was that moment when I realized, yeah, I thought I was safe where I was, but God wanted me in his kingdom, but the devil didn't want me to cross over. But now that I'm here, the devil is not excited, and he's waging war with me. So what am I saying to us, church? You might be seated here having so many billions and thousands of reasons why you're not giving your life to God. Be careful. It could be the devil holding you back. So I gave my life to God. And from that time, I've never looked back. Many people who knew when I was, before I was saved, they would look at me preaching today like, yeah, God is at work which is so true of the scripture that in Galatians 2.20 where Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ now lives in me. Christ now is the center of my life, which is what I like about this church. We are a Christ-central church, but Christ has to be central in our individual lives so that we, are be, we be on fire for God. So when I thought, okay, I've accepted Jesus Christ now, yes, I'm part of the kingdom. What's next? Then I realized that I still need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is my second point. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If we are going to be on fire for God, if we are going to serve God fervently, 
and zealously. You know, when you read the Bible in Acts 10, 38, it says how the Lord God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and how Jesus went about doing good, in particular healing all those that were sick and oppressed because God was with him. And then Jesus says in Luke 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good messages, you know, to the oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So as a church of God, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, church. Are we still there? Just look at your neighbor one more time. Uh, tell them, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So what happened is, uh, when I was attending youth camps, prayer meetings at the church, I saw many people enjoying, some would be dancing, jumping. I'm sure some of us here have been seeing people raising their hands and jumping, and you're wondering, is everything right with, all right with that person? <laughs> that, that's, that's what happens when the Holy Spirit is with you, in you. He, he gives you this joy. He gives you this excitement. It's the fire. That's why you, you, you find somebody is raising their hand. Some, some people want to dive on the floor they, because they are like saying, God, I am nothing without you. Why? The Holy Spirit is fill them. And when the Holy Spirit comes down, there are certain things that the Holy Spirit kicks out of your life. The Holy, Sp the Holy Spirit kicks out anger. The Holy Spirit kicks out bitterness. Uh, accepting Jesus Christ only and standing there is not enough. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I was like, okay, I desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So they called an altar call and they were praying for people. And they laid the hands. I saw some people pray, falling down. Others, I don't know whether we do that at Christ Central or not, but I'm sure I came at a time when there was COVID, so <laughs> six feet distancing. So I don't know how we usually do it, but from the, churches, from the church where I've been, that's what we used to do. Even as the Bible supports that in 2 Timothy 1 verse 6. And I saw some people praying in tongues and all that. I want to do this. So I went there, they prayed for me. Nothing happened. I was like, okay, God, so you have got favoritism. Some you filled, you decided not to fill me. But you wanted me to come to your kingdom. God, you're not fair. Okay, that's all right. But then the preacher encouraged me, keep praying. Keep reading the word of God. Keep worshiping. At the right time, the Holy Spirit will fill you. And then one day I'm at home washing my clothes. Uh, you know, in Zimbabwe, we wash clothes using our hands. Shh. We don't throw them in the, what do you call them? Washing machines here. We don't throw dishes in the washing machine, in the dishwashers. We wash them. Different world. And I'm busy washing my clothes, and I'm so excited, and singing, and just having that moment, you know, with the Lord. And then a language, like an, that just came like an electric shock in my mouth. It went like, and all. So I started speaking in tongues, like, uh, 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 uh. no, Jesus, please take this away. Take this away. Then it came again. Then I started speaking in tongues. Just being at home, I was like, wow, this is awesome. So I quickly ran to the pastors. No, I started They're like, yeah, keep, keep encouraging it. It will get better. And I started speaking in tongues. You know? So we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit if we're going to be on fire. The whole, that's why Jesus said, when Jesus left, he says, I am not going to leave you alone but I'm going to leave you with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit who will teach you everything. Yeah. One of the miracles that I've seen happening, if you look with these two ministers of the word here, can tell you how do they preach every Sunday, Monday. It's not easy to preach. But the Holy Spirit is keeping them fired up. I have seen people here testify who have been with the Lord, who got saved in the 80s, and they're still fired up. Why? It is the Holy Spirit. It's not the thing of the mind. We don't have to reason everything. We just have to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in knowing God. And then the third thing I want to talk about is we need to praise God and worship Him all the time, anywhere, everywhere. Whether you feel like or you don't feel like, we need to worship God. That's why in Acts 16 the Bible says, but about midnight, as Paul and Silas were praying, 
and singing hymns of praise to God. The other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the very foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once all the doors were opened and everyone's shackles were unfastened. Do you know why that miracle happened? It is because there were two men who were taken into prison who had not done anything wrong. Instead, they had delivered somebody and they are taken into the prison. But they get to the prison, they say, God, whether we are in prison or we are in the comfort of our home or I am in a seven-star hotel, I will worship you. And guess what? The other people who were around, they were delivered. It says the foundations of the prison were shaken. All the doors were opened and everyone's shackles were unfastened through the power of worship. Yes. Church, worshiping God is different from listening to Lady Gaga. <laughs> it's different from listening to Beyonce or whatever artist that you like. When we worship God, we pour out our hearts to God. And when we pour out our heart to God, the heavens respond. Have you ever taken a magnet and just wovered it around uh, 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 on top of the iron fillings, which are mixed with the sand? The iron fillings start getting attracted. The sand remains. Why? There is an attraction when the church worships. And it's not only when we come in the church. Worship, praise, and worship should be our lifestyle, it should be a family thing. It should be an individual thing. I can safely tell you this. If you go and check in my music, this is something that I've done ever since I was saved. I can safely tell you 95% of my music is gospel music. When I drive, I'm worshipping. When I'm in the bathroom, I'm worshipping. When I'm at home, I'm worshipping. That's my style. When I come here and the praise and worshipers, they sing awesome songs. I post them on the Facebook wall. You never see me posting Lady Gaga. I don't know why I'm just against Lady Gaga today. <laughs> Maybe there's somebody who's, who needs to be delivered from Lady Gaga. <laughs> why? Worshiping God has more power. I was, you know, there was a time when that song came, Power in the Name. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain. You know, I know this is something you don't know, you don't do in Canada, but in Zimbabwe we do it. I did it. I was in my house and I opened the music so loud for the neighbors to hear. I was like, this song is so good. I want to just share it with my neighbors. And I was playing it so loud. And then at some point I stopped it. And then one of my neighbors comes to me, says, hey, hey, Nove, stop, stop, please. Why did you stop that music? I'm like, oh, I thought I was making noise for you. He's like, no, no, no. Do you know what? When that song was playing, I felt a heavy load go off my shoulders. The minute you stopped, it came back. I was like, this is, this is a good testimony. And then, you know, in between our houses, I just saw a, la a lady who was just kept wandering within the perimeter of our home. And I'm like, is she lost or she's looking for somebody? Then I went and said, she's like, no. The minute I stepped in here, the environment was so cool, warm. It was so amazing. But the minute I stepped into the other line, I start feeling hot. Why? When we worship God, it creates a great atmosphere. It creates a great atmosphere in our home to people around us. It gives us a sweet scent. So I would encourage us, church, that in everything we do, let us worship God. Let's not wait for Mark, Angela, Grace to come and lead us and then. We, it should be something that we do. That when we come here, when Angela stands to sing, we are, we're up there. That's what being on fire for God means. One of my great mentors said a scripture. He said, God forbid that the stones praise and worship him while we are still alive. You know, if you read in Luke, in Luke chapter 19, verse 38 to 40, it talks about that if you, the Pharisees were stopping people from praising God, and God, Jesus said, if you stop them, stones and rocks will worship me. And I'm saying, God forbid that it happens during our time. We will worship God. We will serve God. Why? Because we are on fire for God. My fourth point is, 
Be part of a fired up network of people. You know, show me your friends and I'll tell you your character. Birds of a feather flock together. Fire is contagious. We need to be surrounded or you need to have people who will keep you fired up. People who will keep you going forward. People who when you are slacky or when you feel lazy, they'll say, hey, passionate, come on, move. When you feel like you don't want to pray, you'll say, I am coming to pick you up. We are going for a tech meeting. When you don't feel like, they'll say, hey, hey, Sunday, we are going to church. That's the kind of network that we need to be in. We don't want to be around people who will train us. People who will make you, you call them with 10% of stress. After interacting with them, you are at 110. I like my life group members. Most of them are here today in this service, which is great. Thank you for coming. These guys have kept me fired up ever since I came to Canada. And I want to thank you leaders for connecting me with such a group. You know, every Thursday, sometimes you know you don't feel like going to life group for no reason. It's only one hour, two hours, but you don't feel like going. But we have friends that are encouraging us. You know, so you need to, we need to surround ourselves with people who will keep us on track. People who will keep you moving forward. You know, if you read in the Bible, it talks of Mary and Elizabeth. The Bible says, when Mary and Elizabeth met, you know, they began to prophesy why the babies, Mary was carrying Jesus, Elizabeth was carrying uh, John, and the babies connected. We need to have that kind of a kick. We need that kind of a connection. If you notice what happened with Elijah and Elisha, Elijah, we all know him, he was a great prophet, and he was to be taken by the Lord. And Elisha kept following him. When he, and he persisted. Elisha, Elijah tried to say to Elisha, stay back, stay back. Elisha said no. But when Elijah was taken, he had the double portion of the anointing that Elijah had. So we need to have an, a network of friends that will make you go flying through the roof in seeking God. Flying through the roof in doing things for God. You know, people that will, because this chain of life is long, we don't know how things are going to end this year. We don't know how things are going to end in 2022. But we just need to be around that great atmosphere and God will take us to places we have never dreamt of. I was sharing to, earlier on saying that in Zimbabwe, I used to go to church on Sunday from 7.30 to about 2 p.m. every day. We had a prayer meeting for two hours in the morning. We had a Bible study for one hour, and then we had the main service like this. And then this is one of the things I was asking Rebecca coming to Canada, like, how's the church in Canada? And you guys do 45 minutes. And if the preacher goes past by five minutes, they're like, Joe, Joe, you need to behave. Keep it at 45. You know, that kind of stuff. But I used to do that. The reason why I did that, I wanted to encourage myself in the Lord. I wanted to stay connected. So I want, I'm not saying we should take that and do that. But I'm saying, let's devote our time. Let's devote our energy in seeking God. And then my last thing that I'd like to talk about is, be filled with the Word of God. Be filled. This is the essence of us as Christians. And I'm not going to say much on this one. I have a video that I would like to share with you. I just took it on YouTube. Don't worry about the person. In case maybe he's not a good person, I didn't do much research about him. But he has such a powerful message that he wants to convey to us. May you please pray, play it, and then we'll pray after this. Let me finish with this uh, story. Uh, we go to China from time to time, and, and uh, uh, we train leaders. And this time we brought up 22 leaders from the Hunan province and they rode 13 hours on a train to get to a hotel that they came up two by two in these elevators as, so as to not draw any attention. And then they got to a hotel room, a little apartment uh, room, it's only about 700 square feet in the little living room, no air conditioning, hardwood floor, 22 sat there. I came in and when you teach in China, you start at eight in the morning and you don't get done till five at night. You teach the whole day. They were sitting there, all 22 of them, and I looked around and I said, now, if we get caught, what will happen to me? 
They said, oh, you'll get deported in 24 hours and we'll go to prison for three years. I said, you're kidding. How many of you have been in prison for your faith? Out of 22, 18 raised their hands. I thought, no way. And I looked at them and I said, you, you 22 people, how many people do you oversee? Because they were all of these small group leaders, underground church leaders in the Hunan province. I said, how many, if you counted up all the people under your jurisdiction, how many would it be? And they counted them up and they said, T little over 20 million. I said, what? See, we forget there's 1.3 billion people in China. This is crazy. Well, I had 15 Bibles and I passed them out. Obviously, seven didn't get them. And I said, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 and we're going to read it. And just then, one lady handed hers to somebody next to her. And I thought, hmm, interesting. Well, we turned there anyway. And as we started reading it, I understood why she gave it away. She had memorized the whole thing. She just recited the whole chapter. When it was done, I went over to her at a break and I said, you, you, you recited the whole chapter. She says, oh yes, I've memorized many chapters. I said, where did you memorize so many chapters? She said, in prison. <laughs> she said, you have much time in prison. <laughs> so I said, but don't they confiscate the Bible? And she said, yes. So people bring in scriptures written on pieces of paper and they bring it in. So I said, but then if they find that piece of paper on you, won't they confiscate that? She said, oh, yes, that's why you memorize it as fast as you can. Because <laughs> even though they can take the paper away, they can't take what's hidden in your heart. I thought, wow. Well, after three days, you fall in love with these people. And when it was done, I, I said, how can I pray for you? I'm going to go back to America. And you guys have been just so wonderful. How can I pray for you? They said, you know, Wayne, you guys can gather like this whenever you want to in America. We can't. Could you pray that one day we'll be just like you? And I looked at him and I said, I will not do that. Big incredulous eyes looked at me and they said, well, why? <laughs> I said, because you guys rode a train for 13 hours to get here. In my country, if you've got to drive more than an hour, people don't come. You sat on a wooden floor for three days. In my country, if people have to sit more than 40 minutes, they leave. You sat not only here for three days on a hard wooden floor, but you did it without air conditioning. In my country, if it's not padded pews and air conditioning, people don't often come back. In my country, we have an average of two Bibles per family. We don't read any of them. You hardly have any Bibles, and you memorize them from pieces of paper. I will not pray that we become like, uh, you become like us, but I will pray that we become just like you. Raise our hands. Raising our hands is just a sign of surrender. There's no ritual or anything behind it. Uh, Father, this morning we surrender our lives to you as a church. We are raising our hands as a way of saying we surrender to you as our Lord. We cannot surrender to anyone else other than you, Lord, who is our maker. We pray that you stir up passion for your name in our hearts, Lord. We pray that you fan up the fire, the drive, the love, the earnest yearning for you as Christ's central church. We pray that in all the days of our life on this earth, we serve you fervently and zealously. We know that, Lord, serving you is not in vain, just like David wrote in the book of Psalms. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for blessing us as a church. Thank you for lifting us up. Thank you for empowering us. Thank you for taking us even to places we have never dreamt of. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.